We are aware, but we are not weary. We are woke, but we are not woeful. I started the Birthright Podcast because I was deeply concerned about the doom and gloom narrative that was way too common in mainstream coverage of black maternal health. And that what if we could center joy as a tool for birth equity and justice? The Black Birth Joy Line is a phone number that anyone can call as a podcast extension that features two minute clips of joyful experiences, people actually experiencing joy in their birth times. What is possible if we center joy as our birthright. Let's listen. It was really, really empowering. And in the, the process of the labor, they pulled out the mirror so I could see the crowning. But that was crazy. Like, they were like, oh, there it is. And then, and then I was like, you know, having everybody like cheering at the same time. And I'm like, what's happening? They said, there it is. Keep going, keep going. And I'm like, so they pulled out the mirror. And I was like, oh, my God. I think I pushed like three times and, and she was out. I was listening for the baby because I didn't hear her. And, I, and <laughs> I, when I watched the video, I can see the moment. It was like I stopped breathing. And it was just a moment. And then she cried. And then it was just like, oh, my God, with everything. And then the midwife said, reach down and grab your baby. And I literally reached down and pulled her up. And I just felt like a knotted rope. Like, <laughs> I was like, oh my God. I wasn't expecting that, but okay. And, and she was just amazing and beautiful and like finally here. And it was, everybody was crying. Everybody was crying. <laughs> Goosebumps. Reach down and pull your baby. You know, Emily, when we think about what gets in the way of joy, certainly uh, mental health and emotional health comes to mind. What have you seen in terms of things that have been done, but perhaps solutions that need to be tried going forward? Yeah, thank you. Uh, such an honor to be here and truly an honor to be on the stage with these amazing leaders uh, in this space. So, you know, when I think about mental health, I think about my career path. Uh, I'm a maternal fetal medicine doctor, and to become that, I went through four years of medical school, four years of OBGYN residency, three years of fellowship in maternal fetal medicine, and I'll emphasize those were long years. Um, <laughs> and a lot of questions from my parents about, Do you, don't you have a job yet? Aren't you done? Is something wrong? Uh, but in those 11 years of training to become a maternal fetal medicine doctor, I can count on one hand the number of hours of education I got on perinatal mental health. And that gap is, is dreadful. And then it really didn't surprise me last fall when the CDC released our maternal mortality data and said that mental health conditions are the leading contributor to maternal mortality in our country. 23% of maternal deaths are related to untreated mental health conditions, all preventable. Mm -hmm. And so the good news, and I don't want to dwell in that negative space, uh, but the good news is there's solutions, right? And it's not rocket science. It's bridging silos. Because what we do right now is we require birthing people to fragment themselves into pieces and go to this doctor or this clinician or this center. And then we wonder in this system full of gaps, full of costs, full of inequities, why people are falling through these cracks. Because our American healthcare system doesn't have cracks, it has chasms. And so my life's work is to bridge those chasms with mental health and perinatal care. My vision is to bring mental health care into the fabric of the care that we provide so that we can have emotional wellness for all birthing people. And that's not that innovative, and it's not that novel, and it's not that hard. We just need to talk together. So I do this in a system called the Collaborative Care Model. It's a system where everyone is, has equitable access to expertise in perinatal mental health care. It's a system where everyone who comes into our COMPASS model is entered into a registry, and we hold ourselves accountable to everyone getting their symptoms into remission. So not just those that can come back in front of us, but anyone who touches into our system. We're accountable to making them feel joy again. And we do that by all sitting together. And sitting together with an MFM, a psychiatrist, psychologist, social worker, community health worker, sitting at a table and saying, what can we do better? This person isn't responding. How can we change their care plan to get them into health, into emotional wellness? We did this in Chicago, and it was amazing. 
Because as it turns out, when your healthcare system works for you, people do better. Again, it's not rocket science. We also saw that racial disparities were mitigated because when there's a systematic application of universal access and when we're expecting everyone to respond, that's justice. And so what do you do when you create a successful system? You move across the country and do it again. <laughs> and so I'm now in Rhode Island and my dream and my commitment that I'll publicly state here is that over the next five years, we're gonna have Compass into every prenatal care site across Rhode Island. We're gonna partner with community and make sure it gets there. Thank you. Um, so I'm, I, I think the future's really bright. And I, I, think we, uh, I think we can get there all together. And what's great about Rhode Island, you may notice it at that kind of nugget of a state in the Northeast, you can almost point to it on a map, is that it's tiny. And it's tiny and it can allow us to affect change because it is so small, but it allows us to develop a blueprint for what we can do in other states. And so it's a really exciting place to be to create policy, to devise things with community, and to bring that blueprint forward to affect change nationally. I appreciate that, Emily. And you know, one of the things that has been my mantra for, for years is, um, it's been in all my slide presentations, whatever the question, the answer's in the community, right? Mm -hmm. Whatever the question, the answer's in the community. I think that we have a, an idea that answers lie in lofty places and academic institutions, but the answers are in the community. Um, and so when we look at this, this topic of black birth joy, right? Centering joy, expecting joy, creating a new standard, um, which is joy, right? For us to not just survive, but thrive. Twyla, what are some of the community solutions that we're seeing for black birth and joy. Thank you, Kimberly. So what I think about when I think about community solutions is access to and liberation. My friend Leslie says that word all the time. <laughs> liberation for the birth experience that we all want for ourselves, right? Liberation, that freedom. I also think of my own birth experience, the last one. I got four kids, it's the last one. <laughs> <laughs> I had really during the pandemic, right? And during the pandemic, if you recognize, there was a lot of challenges getting into hospitals and having support when you're in labor. But I advocated for myself. I had a black midwife, I had a black doula, I had a black backup doula, and my black husband. We were all there <laughs> together. I was induced, not what I wanted, but I'm older. Not that old though, I'm under 45. I'm older, <laughs> and I needed to have her, you know, a little bit sooner. My midwife arrived, and I was like, okay, I can get up and walk around now, because I know that helps me when I'm in labor. Got up and I walked around in 10 minutes, Anyone who's had a baby, I was transitioning. <laughs> 10 minutes. Went back to the room, couldn't sit down. I was like, oh, this is interesting. They went and grabbed the midwife. The reason things moved so quickly, I know this in my bones, was because I felt comfortable because my black midwife had arrived. She knew me. She was me, mm -hmm. right? My doula arrived 50 minutes after the midwife. My baby arrived 30 minutes after the midwife. What does that mean? Y'all do the math. <laughs> my husband was my doula. He learned from the two births prior how to provide counter pressure, counter pressure. So doulas are non-clinical professionals, right? They're folks that can come in and provide socio-emotional support, access to and referrals to social determinant of health supports, and physical comfort measures, right? They don't do all the, you know, investigations and they don't do all, nothing under the covers. They don't do that part. But they support <laughs> us to feel good and comfortable while we're delivering our babies. So my husband stepped up and he provided counter pressure. And little Lily came out, all six and a half pounds of her little tiny, loose skin, chicken looking, but adorable body came out. Because I felt relaxed, right? I had all the things I needed in that village. My husband felt comfortable going home because you know after she came out, my black doula was there, my black backup doula happened to be there for another birth, and my midwife was there. So we had a party in my recovery room <laughs> and my husband went home. And why did he go home? He went home because he was at ease. He had peace. He knew that I was safe. He left me in the hospital and took care of the middle two, the lead, the babysitter. I tell you this because the work that we do at Health Connect One is to train community-based birth workers, doulas, breastfeeding peer counselors, perinatal community health workers, the people who understand these communities inside and out. They know what the communities need because they are of the communities. They've had babies. They know the language of the community. They know what's going on on each block in the community. They are trusted by the community. 
and Anne, as Anne likes to say, Anne, you've been quoted many times today. <laughs> Change moves at the pace of trust. And if you're gonna be working with someone in such an intimate way, where they may see you on days that are not your best, where you're having those emotional wellness, those mental health struggles, and they're able to help get you access to the things you need, trust is paramount, right? So having access to those doulas, having access to other community health workers, having access to black birth centers, access to places and spaces that know you, that's vitally important because community has what they need. What they also need are the resources to make sure that those things are strong. Thank you. <laughs> wow, that was really powerful. <laughs> and there's been a lot of talk about midwives, a lot of talk about doulas. Thank you for explaining what they are, because some people get that confused. Please mm -hmm. Google it yes. um, so we can be clear. Um, but we know that these type of perinatal birth workers are critical. But they often, as you mentioned, Dr. Dillion, don't have the support and resources that they need. Um, Atia, talk to us about culturally congruent care and how, what, what are the systemic supports that this new workforce of perinatal health workers that we know are necessary, that we know improve outcomes, what do they need so that they can also thrive? Thanks, Kimberly, and it's great to be here today. Mm -hmm. Um, so I work at a foundation that's focused on transforming healthcare, getting better healthcare through investing in community-centered solutions, and culturally congruent care, um, which is exactly what Tyler, Twyla described. Mm -hmm. It's a team by your side. Mm -hmm. It's um, if you're a patient, you're being served by people that share the same culture, the same language, the same lived experience, and all the evidence points to having better outcomes and healthcare through it. And we all know that doulas are magical. Um, they provide comfort and education and partnerships. And I've been so honored to be working with Twyla over the last couple of years. We've been investing in the first bilingual doula program in New Jersey. And these folks are having an enormous impact. Um, they have been lifelines, especially during COVID where they're navigating new immigrants uh, through very, very messy healthcare situations. Um, one of our doulas that we work with, Teresita, shared, being a doula is a work of love. We want our families to feel respected and to never feel alone. And you know, I've been in public health for 20 years now. I have never seen better outcomes than what we see with doula cared for births. Um, just from the statistics, you're seeing 70% reduction in preterm births, much lower C-sections, much higher rates of breastfeeding, and probably even more importantly, you're having the experience that Twyla had, much more satisfaction. Um, and I am so proud that this program that we've been working on just got um, money through the congressional earmark process through Representative Bonnie Watson Coleman, who's championing the Momnibus. So on Thursday, we're announcing these new funds which will be able to serve every woman in Trenton, New Jersey with a doula. Um, so these are really, really special people. And to your point about what do they need, we need to make sure that doulas are valued by the healthcare system. Mm -hmm. We need to make sure that they're paid sustainable wages. And from lots of conversations I've had with Ron Lee and my amazing fellowship, we need to make sure that these folks were taking care of their mental health mm -hmm. and well-being, because we've got to take care of the people holding our families up. So true. Um, and I think this idea of understanding what is necessary and then making sure that workforce has what they need to survive, which includes systems change, right? Mm -hmm. And I, we've been talking about joy. But how does joy exist within the same systems that Emily mentioned have, has chasms, have chasms and things like that? So I would love for you all to talk about what is the vision for systems change that we need to actually achieve uh, joy um, in birth? Twyla, you want to start? Happily. <laughs> um, so I believe that it's, it's vital that the folks who are providing the support, as Atiya shared, um, one, yes, get the support they need for their mental health, but also don't have to face the same biases that those they serve do when they enter hospital systems. 
um, when they enter any clinical setting, when they enter any social determinant of any setting, let's put it that way, um, the people we train are of the community, as I said before. So a lot of the same experiences that those that they serve have, they also have. But then they still have to hold up the folks that they're supporting in the community. And what does that result in? That results in three to five years burnout. So the people who are most seasoned and have the most experience and have seen the most and can support the most aren't gonna be, gonna be there. Who's gonna train the people? Who's gonna have that legacy of that work? Who's gonna pass that on? They're just not gonna be there. So really being thoughtful and intentional about not just supporting the mental health of the people who, you know, obviously we know need the support because they're, they're the folks that are birthing the children, but also those that are gonna help to make the, the changes different. Another important point, recognizing that duels are part of the solution. We've been saying this a lot. Doulas are not the solution, right? And it's, it's the same as when we talk about anything having to do with racism and bias, right? We shouldn't expect the people who are most impacted by it to solve it. But doulas enter and everyone's like, well, you know, they can fix it. We're just gonna put it all in the doulas. Let's invest in just the doulas. There are so many other issues, so many systems that need to be dismantled if the doula work is gonna really have the effect that we hope that it will. Right, we can't train doulas to go work in oppressive environments because that's not gonna work either, mm -hmm. right? And it's not fair to put the, uh, point the finger at doulas as a solution for a problem they did not create, right? Yes. That has existed for years. And I think one of the things, and I would love for you to speak about this, Emily, as a physician, is that tension that can exist, mm -hmm. right? And that culture, mm -hmm. and how that piece is part of system change, as you see it. Absolutely, I think our system is tragically broken. It's not working. I think we have to be honest with ourselves that we are not in any way, shape, or form meeting the outcomes that we would expect, much less joy or light uh, in the birthing process. And so I think there's so much disruption that needs to happen in the healthcare system. And we need to be open and honest and humble about we don't have the answers. Community has the answers. We have to work together. It's not that we don't have medical expertise. It's not that we don't have the training to manage complications. But these systems changes require partnership. They also require higher levels of communication and policy change. I mean, I'm a maternal fetal medicine doctor, and I will tell you, I have 15-minute visits for prenatal care for people living with HIV, with schizoaffective disorder, experiencing homelessness. And let me tell you how much we can cover in that time. It's nothing. And so how do we restructure how we deliver health care so that people who need more get more? And people who need, that, that's the birth justice that we need, is that we can tailor the resources that are applied and not just a, try to apply a cookie cutter 15 minute visit mm -hmm. to everybody. Yeah. Atiyah, did you want to add about that in terms of systems change? Yeah, I mean, I think one thing that I really do feel we need to have is more data mm -hmm. around the value of community doulas and peer support right now, especially to you know, build that value with, with the healthcare system and frankly with obstetricians and mm -hmm. physicians as well. So I've been really excited that through the Ascend Fellowship and Dr. Craig Garfield, I've gotten to know Emily and, and her work and her students at Brown University. So they're actually gonna be coming in and evaluating the program in Trenton. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll have more data, which I think will help to continue to show the value of doulas. Mm -hmm. The other thing is over the last couple of years, I've learned a lot more about the midwifery model of care. And midwives, you know, as we've talked about, they are licensed clinicians, um, they deliver full spectrum reproductive care, and they deliver babies. And frankly, they're the standard of care basically everywhere else other than the United States. Yes. Um, but they're only delivering you know, 10% of births in the United States. And there are very, very few black midwives. Um, so you know, I would really like to work you know, with a coalition to figure out how do we improve the regulatory conditions for midwives? Mm -hmm. How do we make sure that they're getting paid um, equally at parity with physicians? How do we break down some of those educational barriers um, so that we'll, we'll have more pathways for them? Yeah, and also just in terms of the historical relevance that midwives were delivering babies for since the beginning of time, like that was their job. If you look at it historically around the turn of the century, there was a group of predominantly white male physicians who began to demonize and then criminalize midwives so that they could take over this business of birth, right? And so when birth became a medical event, got moved into a hospital when it didn't have to be in the hospital, you are not sick, right? Um, but you are, the most women in this country give birth with a surgeon, that's a whole nother topic. 
But when that happened, it really led to less, um, a less quality of care. Our outcomes have, have not gone up. In fact, on, as a country, we are on par with you know, many less developed nations. And it is, for me, the state of mothers is a lens for society. Mm -hmm. And it's not making us look very good right now, right? In terms of our maternal mortality rate nationwide, um, black, white, any, any color, creed, or race. And so when we think about that history, we need to think about how we can undo that and to reestablish, as we've been talking about, that person-centered care, understanding those community solutions, thinking about what we need to break those cultural barriers, um, not just on the community side, but among physicians as well, so that they can be acceptive and receptive and welcoming to this new workforce that we know needs to happen for us to achieve birth equity and justice. Right? Mm -hmm. So we've been talking a lot about joy, but our session is also about justice. So I wanted just to talk briefly a little bit about that vision. What is the path for, in, in your mind, um, to justice for birthing people? Emily, you want to start? Yeah, I can jump in. And I just want to make sure we create space to talk about reproductive justice and mm -hmm. what that looks like in our country, particularly at this moment. Um, you know, right now we have so much legislation and so many barriers to birthing people being able to choose if and when they decide to have a family. Um, and those obstacles are really, I, I see them daily. I'm in a state where I can provide abortions legally, uh, and that's a very safe place, but I work with colleagues around the country that can't, that are having to make horrific decisions about, you know, when is someone's life at jeopardy? What does that look like? How do I have to wait and watch someone get devastatingly sick as a physician that took an oath to do no harm um, and balance that with the risk of criminalization, right? The risk that your family could be murdered in your backyard if you do a procedure and you're caught. And, and so that, that tension is real and I just wanna make sure we carve out that space because all of us have the opportunity to advocate for reproductive justice and we have to um, because women are dying, birthing people are dying if we don't offer them these options. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so important. And for us to expand that definition to not just the ability and the right to decide when and where you choose to have a family, but to when you do make that choice to survive that childbirth, mm -hmm. to have a wonderful postpartum experience with uh, emotional health supports, mm -hmm. to raise your child in a community that is safe. Mm -hmm. You know, like we really have to extend that definition because when it is often narrowly defined, there's a whole spectrum of reproductive needs that can get ignored. Um, Atiyah, what's your vision for justice? Yeah, I really believe that every woman should be, should have the right to have respectful, equitable maternal care, and that they should be listened to, and they should be heard. And I think a lot of times, we sometimes, for certain segments of the population, we have too much intervention, and you know that causes a lot of unnecessary procedures, and it's quite expensive to the system. And then for some people, particularly black and brown families, they get too little intervention, and are not listened to, and are not heard. So I wanna kinda flip the switch on that. And I think it is so important, you know, Kimberly, what you're doing with Earth, mm -hmm. really, really valuing each person's patient experience. And I'd love, I mean, if you'd like to take a few minutes to talk about that, it would be great. Because well, I think that's such an important lever as we're talking about justice. Well, I think that it's really important that we lift up the lived experience. The Earth app is a Yelp-like tool for black and brown women and birthing people to find and leave reviews of their OBGYNs, birthing hospitals, and pediatricians. So we crowdsource that information because we believe the community needs to inform and protect each other. And then on the back end, we turn those reviews into data to work directly with hospitals, payers, and providers. We're excited about the ways our hospital improvement plans are expanding across the country in various cities. Um, and it's critically important that we start holding systems accountable, right? Mm -hmm. Systems change will not happen without accountability. And in our vision, birth equity and justice will not happen without transparency, mm -hmm. right? It's that, trans it's that transparency that drives the accountability that pushes for systems change, and that is where we play um, in terms of what we do at the Earth app. So thank you, Atiyah, for giving me a moment to mention that. I'm wearing my other hat today. <laughs> But it is critically important that we lift up community voices, right? And that 
health systems are not just accountable to regulatory and other policies. They are accountable to the people that they yes. serve. And we tell health hospital folks all the time, if the black and brown folks in your community don't say that they feel seen, heard, and respected, you haven't done your job. You haven't fully done your job, right? There's more work to do. And so it is not just to not kill us or nearly kill us. We deserve a five-star experience. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It, we deserve a five-star experience. Yes. And so we're excited about the cities that we're expanding to um, and the ways that our work is growing. And this is part of justice, which also include innovation, right? Mm -hmm. Technology, mm -hmm. thinking about new platforms and tools, and bringing in new ways of thinking and other things that could help accelerate the visions that we all have. Thank you, Atiyah. <laughs> Twyla? If she didn't do it, I was going to. Um, so for me, justice is the awareness of all the things that are possible, right? So knowing in a community that may not look like the communities that we all live in, that you can have access to a doula, right? People may not even know what that is. So a huge thing that's gonna be important for me over the next few years is making sure that there is more awareness in every community of what a doula does and that you deserve to have one, right? That's something that's absent and I feel like it is unjust, but the Earth app will help with that too because doulas also leave reviews, which that's I'm right. quite proud of. Doulas can leave reviews in the Earth app and it's I-R-T-H, I-R-T-H, birth, but we dropped the B for bias. So um, we love your support and to check it out. Um, so let's move into our call to action. You know, we are very passionate about what we do and what we work for and what we stand for. But what is it? What is your vision for mamas and birthing people across the country? What is your wish for them? Atiyah? I want everyone to be listened to and heard. And I want to welcome their babies with joy and hope and immense love and community. Mm. How about you, Emily? Love that. Uh, I want people to not feel like they have to fragment themselves into disease states to mm -hmm. come into care. I want our system to accept a whole birthing person and all their beauty and all their imperfections and all their joy and their families. My wish is a feeling. I don't have any other way to put it. My wish is that every birthing person has the feeling that I had when Lily came out, right? Mm -hmm. This feeling of knowing that you are fully supported. There's nowhere you can turn or slip or fall where there's not going to be somebody there to catch you. Yeah. And somebody that looks like you, if that's what you want. <laughs> if that's what you want. That's important. And my <laughs> wish is, um, I get to answer this question. My wish is co-liberation, right? Mm -hmm. this, uh, this model that, you know, we are here to achieve birth equity and justice, not because we want to help and save people, but that we recognize that our lives are inextricably linked, right? And that you're not free if I'm not free. Mm -hmm. And I'm not free if you're not free. And that no mother will be free until all mothers are free. Thank you.